Welcome everyone to this webinar titled, Is it Roy E. Harrington or Roy S. Harrington? How to make technology work for you in an ArchivesSpace data cleanup project. I'm Jessica Crouch, the Community Engagement Coordinator for ArchivesSpace, and I'm joined today by Amy Barish, Katie Martin, and Darren Young of the Rockefeller Archive Center. This webinar is being recorded and a copy of the recording and presentation slides will be made available on our website in the coming days. In this webinar, three processing archivists from the Rockefeller Archive Center will discuss collaborative approaches to mass data cleanup in archive space. Presenters will share how they planned, reassessed, and executed various automated and manual processes for enhancing the quality of their institution's descriptive data. This data includes agent records, dates, and access restriction notes. This discussion is based off of the Center's Archive Space Cleanup blog series you may have seen recently circulating online. Your presenters today are Amy Barish, Katie Martin, and Darren Young. Amy Barish is an archivist at the Rockefeller Archive Center, where she works as a member of the processing team. Aside from processing incoming collections, she also contributes to various digital projects. Amy holds a master's in library and information science from the University of Pittsburgh. Katie Martin is an assistant archivist at the Rockefeller Archive Center, where she processes collections of the Ford Foundation and works on projects with the digital team. She earned degrees in history and American studies from Purdue University and received her MLS with a specialization in archives and records management from Indiana University. Darren Young is an assistant archivist at the Rockefeller Archive Center, where he processes collections of the Ford Foundation and collaborates with the digital team on select projects. He earned a BA in English Literature and History at the University of Connecticut and received his MLIS with a concentration in archives management from Simmons College, now Simmons University. We will hold all questions until the Q&A session at the end, so if you think of a question that you'd like to ask during the session, you're welcome to go ahead and type that into the Q&A panel at any time. We do ask that you type your question into the Q&A panel, which is the op op option that says Q&A at the bottom of your screen, and not the chat option. And with that, we'll welcome Amy, Katie, and Darren. And Amy, if you'd like to start us off. Thanks, Jess. Um, I um, I'm going to start now. So um, as you might have gathered from the bios, all three of us are processing archivists at the Rockefeller Archive Center, which is located in Sleepy Hollow, New York, uh, which is about an hour north of New York City. The Rockefeller Archive Center opened in 1974, and we operate as an independent nonprofit institution. The RAC holds and makes available the papers of the Rockefeller family, the philanthropic institutions they founded, and records from other international philanthropic organizations. We would like to note that the RAC does have a larger staff. We have over 20 full-time archivists who are divided among various teams throughout the institution who often collaborate on projects with one another. So at the Ar Rockefeller Archive Center, we use a series of tools, one of course being ArchivesSpace. We use ArchivesSpace as our main repository for finding aid data. We have an independent front-facing discovery system called Dimes, where researchers engage with our material. And we also use GitHub to store various scripts and open source code that we create to help us automate tasks for all teams at the RIC. So I'm just going to give a little bit of context for how these projects came about. As I mentioned before, we do use our own discovery system called Dimes as a way for researchers to interact with our collections whose data is held in archive space. We are in the process of moving to a new discovery system that is currently in the development stage. So in thinking about this new generation of dimes, we knew that no matter how great our new system would be, it would be hindered by some of our known data issues. And these issues for the most part are a result of legacy data that was inherited from other content management systems. And these data issues were not only making it difficult for researchers to navigate our collections, but it had become a pain point for staff as well. So this data cleanup would be a priority before the launch of our new system and was a collaborative effort between the processing and digital strategies teams to find automated approaches to working with large amounts of data in archive space. So we divided the data cleanup initiative into three smaller projects to address each type of data. And this is pretty much how we're going to set up the rest of this webinar. First, Darren will talk about our methods for cleaning up agent data followed by Katie detailing how we removed legacy access notes. And lastly, I will explain how we added structured dates to our entire repository. Um, we will be going through these projects relatively quickly, but I should note that all of these projects are further explained on our blog, which is linked here. So I will now hand it off to Darren to talk about cleaning up our agents. Thanks, Amy. 
So I'm gonna give an overview of the work we and our colleagues performed to clean up our institution's agent records. To begin, I'm gonna talk about what our institution wanted to do with our agent records and what about our agent data prevented us from doing so. These are links to two agent records as they appear within a resource record in archive space. Clicking on the link to the Nancy Boggs uh, link will bring you to the agent record representing the Nancy Boggs entity. And then this is how an agent appears in a finding aid on our discovery and delivery platform Dimes. The Nancy Boggs and Ford Foundation entities are formatted as plain text under the creator heading which describes their relationship to the collection. They are not actionable and our system is not set up for users to search our records by agent. As Amy has discussed, our institution is in the process of developing a new access system for our materials. And one of the objectives of this new design is implementing functionality for our agents. If a user could click on the Ford Foundation, if it were a functional access point, they could retrieve all the other resource records that have that agent linked to them. This could greatly improve access and discovery for researchers, as well as better convey the relationships between our collections. But our agent data and the way that it existed did not avail itself to this type of functionality. The digital strategies team and our supervisor, the head of processing, Bob Baddeley, knew this when they approached us with the project to clean up our agent data and preparation for the move to new dimes. The different issues they had identified with the agent records in our repository included the large number of duplicate records representing the same entity, inaccurate data within the records, no consistency in terms of how records were created, and a massive amount of agent records assigned at the file level within our Ford Foundation grants and ca catalog reports collections. This, these issues were in large part caused by large scale exports of data from other content management systems into archive space. Resolving these problems required two different courses of action. One, we needed to remove all duplicate agents from our repository in order to ensure there would be a single record for each entity, with the remaining record being the most accurate. Two, we needed to remove all file level agents from within the four foundation grants and catalog reports resource records. I'm first gonna talk about how we went about resolving a duplicate agents problem. Initially, we hoped that we could develop, a, that we could write a Python script or multiple scripts that we could use to automate the process of delete, deleting the duplicates from archive space. As mentioned before, the processing team had prior experience collaborating with the digital strategies team on developing scripts that can manipulate data across our repository. Our first step to do this involved collecting all the Asian data we possessed and analyzing it in order to identify patterns we could target with the script. With help from the digital strategies team, we were able to export all of our agent data to CSV files. We had CSV files for each type of agent in our system, person, corporate, and family. Looking at the CSV files and then investigating particular examples of agent records within archive space, we realized that the issues we had with our agent data were far more numerous and complex than we had imagined. To describe a few of these problems, there were agent names with different middle initials, Roy E. Hanger Harrington, Roy L. Harrington, Roy S. Harrington, for example, all meant to represent the same entity. Although not true in this instance, oftentimes this sort of thing happened because the person who created the agent record tried to fit in the Library of Congress name authority that did not actually apply. There were multiple examples where it appeared somebody found an LOC name authority and thought it represented any they were trying to describe because part of the name matched the person or organization for which they were looking to create an agent record. Furthermore, by comparing the different agent records, we discovered that there were discrepancies in terms of name formatting. Many records use the primary part of name field to describe the entire name of an agent while others broke apart the name with the other fields, rest of name, dates, suffix, for example. We could not figure out how to articulate a solution to these problems so that a script could understand and perform the necessary procedures to accomplish it. Our investigations into the agent data proved that our idea of targeting agent records with no source would not work. We had assumed that an agent without a source would be invalid and that we could remove the agent records we did not want by writing a script to, to unlink agents without a source but our actual data show that there were plenty of agents without sources that were valid and were actually the appropriate agent to use, and that having a source by no means guaranteed that a record would be correct or accurate. The amount of research and analysis it required for us, for us to assess the many problems impacting our agent data convinced us that the, remedia the remediation of those issues would require an equal level of intervention on the part of the archivist. We opted to go a manual route towards reducing the number of agents in our system that consisted of going through all of the records on our CSV files, comparing and assessing ones that appear to describe the same entity, and deciding whether to keep, merge, or delete the agent. We also favored a manual approach because of, because of the control it gave us in ensuring we would not sever archival objects from the creator. Merging would safely transfer that relationship to the right agent record. 
This work rel relied upon our use of the enhanced agent merging function in ArchiSpace, which allows you to select an agent record, choose a duplicate agent you wish to merge into it, compare the different agents, and then merge the duplicate into the agent you selected. This slide shows how when using this function, you can compare two different agent records and choose what information you may want to bring over when you merge. We managed this work by dividing our CSV files between the three of us and tracked what actions we performed by writing keep, merge, or delete next to the agent names. Merge meant that we used the enhanced merging function on the agent. Keep meant that we found that, it the, that we found the record suitable and did not need to take any action on it. And delete was used for the cases where it made more sense to outright delete an agent rather than merging it with another. This was done when Archival Objects' create a relationship would not be lost if an agent record was deleted. In the end, we merged 6,704 agent records, which made up 18% of the total number of agent records within our repository. The work took three months for us to complete, but we were happy with our approach because we were confident that we had cleaned up all the sneaky issues that we may have missed with the script. And we knew that by merging the agent records individually, we had preserved the relationships between our agent entities and our archival objects. Nevertheless, there were some drawbacks to our manual merging approach. The project was slow in many ways. Not only did it take a lot of time for us to assess and take action on an enormous amount of, of agent entities, the actual process of using the merging function in ArchiSpace proved a little slow. Moreover, the merging function impacted ArchiSpace for performance for everyone using the system. We definitely felt some guilt about how our work was affecting our colleagues during these months. There were also a few ArchiSpace performance issues caused by merging some of the agents with invalid data. Fortunately, that only happened a couple of times. Turning to the other area of our agent records cleanup work, I'll give a little background on what the four foundation grants and catalog reports collections are and the problem with their file level agents. The grant files collection was created by the four foundation information management unit to document all the foundation's grant making activities within a centralized location. The collection consists of almost 45,000 grant files and over 9,000 microfilm reels. Likewise, the catalog reports collection was created by the four foundation archives and information management unit to create a centralized location for reports and other significant documents to be used as a sort of internal library. There are almost 20,000 reports in the collection. The original microfilm has been digitized and researchers may access these digital copies on site using the Rockefeller Archive Center's access portal virtual vault. These grants and reports are represented as individual files within their respective finding aids and as the numbers I suggest. 45,000 20,000. As the numbers I shared suggest, 45,000 and 20,000, there are a lot of files. The description in our finding aids for those collections was transferred out of systems Ford maintained, and Ford had assigned agents to the individual grants and reports. At the Rockefeller Archive Center, we do not link agents to the file level as part of a regular processing workflow, so the massive amount of file level agents in these two collections significantly skewed our agent data towards entities linked to single documents as creators or subjects rather than creators of resources. Furthermore, these agents were not particularly useful because the entities they described are named in the file titles. Figuring out what to do for this part of the project proved much easier than clearing out the duplicate agents because we could clearly identify the problem. We wanted agents removed from the file level in a select group of finding aids. Knowing that, we were able to work with the digital strategies team to write a Python script that would unlink all agent records from, the from file level archival objects in an indicated resource record. To run the remove agent script, you have to supply the resource ID for the collection guide on which you want to work. The script iterates through every file in the collection guide, unlinking all the agent records it discovers. We ran the script every day near closing time so that the script would work through the night and not interfere with any of our colleagues. We used a Google spreadsheet to track the progress we made. We were able to complete running the script across all 18 grants and catalog reports resource records without encountering any significant issues. We successfully unlinked 82,041 file level agents in total. In this situation, an automated approach proved the best method because we could clearly articulate directions for a script to take and produce the desired outcome. I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Katie, who will talk about her work on the Access Restriction Notes project. Thanks, Erin. Okay, I'm going to spend some time talking about the process of writing a Python script to remove unnecessary repeating notes from our finding aids. So in October 2018, I was approached by members of the Rockefeller Archive Center Digital Strategies team, as well as the head of processing to work on a solution for a problem that caused headaches for reference staff in the reading room. In the transition from paper finding aids to digital finding aids, there were access restriction notes that we no longer needed that appeared thousands of times at the file level of more than 40 finding aids. 
The note was a variation of open for scholarly research with prior archival review. Retrieval time may exceed 24 hours. Anytime a researcher wanted to access a folder of material with one of these notes attached to it, a reference staff member had to move this folder into an awaiting review queue in our research request system. And then from there, manually clear them from that queue before the folder could be served to a researcher. To clear something from that queue, someone was supposed to review the entire contents of a folder to make sure that nothing actually needed to be restricted. We also needed to confirm that the embargo dates at the collection level were met and that individual folder list restrictions no longer applied. Our current practice is to assign these types of restrictions at the collection level. And all these outdated conditions governing access notes at the file level needed to be deleted. An automated solution would save a lot of time. This problem was also an opportunity for me to learn Python scripting and learn how to work with the archive space API. So I think it's important to say that before this project, I had no previous experience writing Python scripts, but I did have experience running scripts for other projects at the RIC. So I understood how useful they could be to automate large amounts of work. In a meeting to kick off the project, I was presented with some parameters for what the script needed to do. We needed a script that could work with archive space data to find and delete a specified note within an individual finding aid resource record. A user should enter the resource ID number and then enter the text of the access restriction note. The script should then run and delete all the specified conditions governing access notes at the folder level within that finding aid. The script would be most useful if there were repeated notes of the same type within a finding aid that needed to be changed or deleted simultaneously. For the actual process of writing the script, I wrote the code with guidance from Patrick Galligan, digital archivist. To move the project forward, I met with Patrick every week for short 15 minute or less stand up meetings to discuss any problems I encountered during the previous week. Some weeks I might accomplish quite a bit, but there were other weeks where processing tasks or other data cleanup projects got in the way. And the main point was just to keep pushing forward. So to learn Python basics, I took the Python Code Academy course. This was helpful, but I needed more concrete examples to learn how Python and the Archive Space API can work together. I found that reading about this alone was unhelpful at first, and I needed to see how things actually work. So I spent a lot of time looking at a previous RE3 script used to edit notes. I updated the script from Python 2 to Python 3 and tried to incorporate the functionality we needed from there. This was not particularly easy, and I think it was helpful for me to know that Amy, someone also coming from a processing background, had successfully written scripts for the RAC before. Some of the most challenging aspects for me as a beginner were learning how to loop through JSON hierarchies, to retrieve a desired object, and then to carry variables through Python functions. Ultimately, the script I wrote iterates through a given collection, file, or series provided by user input and finds note content that matches the user input and then deletes or modifies relevant notes according to user preference. So this needed to happen quite often, and I learned a lot through trial and error. Over the course of writing the script, I incorporated many changes suggested by our digital strategies team members. Early on, it was suggested I look into utilizing Archive Snake for this work. Archive Snake is a community developed client library that simplifies scripting against the backend API of Archive Space. Archive Snake lets users interact with archive space data through both a low level API that lets users easily fetch JSON and save it to a variable, as well as a higher level abstraction layer that lets you ignore some of the lower level details of the archive space API. I needed to use both the high level abstraction level and the low level client in the edit note script. Another aspect of writing this script was adding fuzzy string matching. Right now, the script uses Rapid Fuzz, a Python string matching library. Within one finding aid, notes might have small variations or extra spaces, and string matching can help control how lax or restrictive you want to be when removing notes. Users of the edit note script need to identify a confidence ratio, which is the percentage of similarity between the note string you enter into the command line and the note string that exists within the finding aid before it can be removed. For example, if I needed to remove all versions of open in 2000x, I would use a lower confidence ratio to ensure that all restriction notes from the 2000s were removed from a particular finding aid. If I wanted to ensure that only open and 2002 notes were removed, then I could set the confidence ratio higher. I typically used a high confidence ratio of 97 during my work. While writing the script, I also met frequently with the head of processing to make sure what I was doing still aligned with his original vision for this script. 
Through these conversations, I learned that the script would be helpful in removing embargo dates from collections. I added functionality so you can run the script and have a log all the boxes that conditions governing access notes were removed from. This means that someone could take the log from the script down to the vault to remove physical restriction notes from individual folders. One of the last tasks to streamline the script was to add argparse, which is a Python module that allows users to provide values for variables directly in the command line. Argparse eliminates the need to rewrite lines of code within the script if you want to make a minor change each time you run it. Adding argparse meant that many of my original functions within the script needed to be consolidated and rethought. Originally, the script required a lot of user input, and the script would ask for one piece of information at a time. You can imagine this was annoying when testing the script, and it would only get worse when running the script on many finding aids. With argparse, I put a single command in the command line that needs to include the note type, action choice, so modify or delete, the search string, the original note in archive space, and the level of the hierarchy within a finding aid, so file item or series. An optional argument is the replacement note string if a user is modifying notes. The script can then take these arguments and hopefully run without issue. It takes much less time to run the script now that you don't have to respond to multiple prompts from the command line. If a command is written incorrectly, the arg parse module also provides help messages to get you back on track. Near the end of the project, I adapted the script so it can be used to change or delete any type of note across finding aid and archive states, so not just for access restriction notes. By the time the script was complete, additional unnecessary legacy notes were identified for removal, and this work could be tied in with the other archive space cleanup projects. I put the final touches on the script in February 2020, and I was ready to start cleaning up the outdated unnecessary notes. Before going into the actual data cleanup, I just want to talk about how to run the script and what that entails. So first, you identify a finding aid that has repeating notes of the same type. Then in the command line, a user enters the command formatted for the argparse module. The information included is the note type, so in this case, access restrict note, the action type, modify or delete, resource ID, which has to be an integer, the original content of the note you want to change or delete, the level of a note within a finding aid hierarchy that the user wants to change, so in this case, file, and the new note content if you're modifying existing notes, which isn't required if you're deleting. A log of the changes are then printed to the console and the instance information for changed objects are recorded in a spreadsheet. Now moving on to the actual data cleanup. In early March, I was given a list of approved notes that could be removed from archive space, including all of those prior archival review notes. I found that variations of that note appeared more than 20,000 times. I used the search feature in archive space to identify finding aids with the outdated legacy notes, and I created a spreadsheet to track the text of the notes deleted, how many notes were deleted, and the finding aid information. Most of the notes were removed via script, but if notes appeared only one time in the finding aid, then I just verified and removed them manually. In March and April, I removed 14 different types of use and access restriction notes that appeared over 27,000 times across 679 finding aids. Working from home, I was able to dedicate most of my work hours to this particular project. As I mentioned at the beginning, this project started in the fall of 2018. I didn't know what to expect, but I didn't know it would take over a year to write and then rewrite the script. One lesson for me was that sometimes other projects take priority, and that's okay. Plugging along by spending a couple hours here and there was probably a blessing. The extra time meant that code improvements like ARG parts could be incorporated, I was able to solve more than one notes related problem. In the end, I was confident the script worked as intended. If I could go back to the beginning, I would probably ask more direct questions from other people who code at our institution, just to make sure I was initially set up for success. When you start out doing this type of work, it's hard to tell if the problems you are encountering are a simple formatting error, some kind of authentication issue, or a real problem with the function you're writing. Another lesson was that writing quality code takes more than one person. Having another person review your code will make your work cleaner and easier to read, but someone else might have a better solution to a problem than you. For the purposes of running a script on individual finding aids for data cleanup purposes, I'd also suggest limiting the input required from a user. If the script asks for a resource ID, note, username, password, it's going to take a lot of time. Limiting this makes the repetitive process of running a script over and over again less work. So that's all I have, and I'll turn the presentation now over to Amy. Thanks, Katie. Um, that's great. Um, so I'm going to talk about 
how we added structured dates to what ended up being our entire archive space repository. So to start, I'd like to give some background information on the state of our data. So in most cases, we do have date expression data for a lot of our archival objects, but unfortunately, our structured or normalized dates are not always present. This is mostly because of finding a data that was imported into archive space that was missing begin and end dates in the first place. But it is also entirely possible that these structured dates were never enter entered to begin with. So structured dates are also known as begin and end dates, and they are usually the data point that is used when you are conducting a faceted search in a discovery system. So using something like the search by date rate range function is an example of how structured dates are used. So now I want to talk a little bit about um, how what these fields are in archive space specifically. So in archive space, the date expression field is a free text field, meaning you can enter both words and numbers. So words like spring or circa can be used in the date expression field. On the other hand, the begin and end fields are structured data, meaning they follow a designated pattern. So like year, month, day, which is a pattern that a computer is able to understand and then parse or do something with. So what we wanted to do was to use the date expression field, which was data that we already had, to add the missing data, which in this case was structured begin and end dates, to all or at least most of our archival objects in archive space in order to facilitate improved faceted searching within our discovery system. So our original plan going into this was to use the calculate dates tool that's already in archive space to add structure, structured begin and end dates to all series level components across our repository. We thought by adding dates to the series to just the series level would be such an improvement over where we started that we wouldn't necessarily need to invest the time and effort to add dates across the entire repository, which in this case would include all of our archival objects. We knew that getting our data to be 100% would be extremely time consuming. And at the beginning of this, we really didn't think that we had the time or resources to make that work. So we wanted to make the largest improvement we could, knowing our data would never be perfect by doing the least amount of tedious work. So as some of you might already know, um, in order to use the Calculate Dates tool, you need actual dates. So the Calculate Dates tool relies on the existence of structured dates on the archival objects below it to produce top level dates. So because most of our archival objects didn't have structured dates, the tool could not calculate an accurate date, date range for the series level. This sort of put a wrench in our plan and we determined that we wouldn't be able to use this tool to improve our data. So what we really needed to do was get a more bird's eye view of our date data to see how severe this problem was and how many of our archival objects were missing these structured dates. With some assistance from the digital strategies team, we were able to get a CSV that contained all of the date objects in our repository. I was then able to import that CSV into OpenRefine and use various filters and search tools to see exactly how many structured dates were missing. It turns out that over 195,000 out of 650,000 archival objects were missing structured dates. Ultimately, this meant that we were going to have to add structured dates to pretty much our entire repository, which was more work than what was initially conceived at the beginning of this project and was sort of the thing that we hoped we wouldn't have to do. So because we were looking at editing hundreds of thousands of records, um, manually doing this work was just not an option. I began looking for some automated solutions and came up with a wish list of what we wanted this tool to do for us. So some of the tools I encountered during my research are listed here and have been used by other institutions to help them with their own date cleanup projects. Ultimately, we wanted a tool that was relatively simple to use and install, and it would also need to be able to parse date formats other than year, month, day, because we had some pretty interesting date expressions in our repository that were far from the expected format. And because we were working with such a large amount of data, we wanted to have confidence in the data we were changing. 
We also wanted the tool not to change anything it didn't understand. We would rather it do nothing when it encounters a really odd date expression than to replace that data with something like the word null or replace that data with an empty value. So by looking at our wish list um, and our data, we decided that time, the TimeWalk plugin would work best for us. Um, let me just go back one slide. There we go, okay. So TimeWalk is an automated date parser for archive space. Um, it will automatically parse any values in the date expression field into ISO compliant, compliant begin and end values. TimeWalk also parses out date certainties and sets the calendar and era values automatically. And the link to this tool is in this slide. So um, we began by first installing the TimeWalk plugin on our development server just to get a better sense of how it worked. Using real examples of dates from our repository, I was able to see what date expressions it could and couldn't parse. So the next two slides are going to include example date expressions from our repository and show how TimeWalk responded to those dates. So here is a table containing a list of date expressions that TimeWalk was able to understand and then parse. As you can see, when given a date expression, TimeWalk then fills out the corresponding begin and end dates along with the certainty field where that's applicable. So for example, TimeWalk was able to understand some variations of the word undata, undated in the circa 1950 and C period 1950 examples. You can see that TimeWalk filled out the begin date as 1950 for both of those date expressions and then set the certainty to approximate. In some of the earlier examples on this table, you'll see that it handles different date formats such as month, day, and year, and even things like spring 1966 and early 1950s were able to be successfully parsed and the begin and end date fields were populated. Overall, I was really impressed by how robust this tool was and just by how successful it was on some of our odd date expressions that were far from the normal year, month, day um, format. So now here's a different table that contains a list of date expressions from our collections that TimeWalk was unable to parse. You'll see that certain variations of the word undated, like the words no date or N period D, were not understood. Additionally, abbreviated months with a period at the end, like DEC for December and then a period, could not be parsed either. Now you might remember from the earlier slide that a date expression containing JAN for January was successfully parsed. It seems that time walk could handle abbreviated months so long as there was not a period at the end. As you can see towards the bottom of the table here, words like probably or exhibited were used in the date expression field for some of our archival objects. TimeWalk understandably could not parse these expressions. But remember that TimeWalk was able to parse certain words like spring or circa in the earlier slides. And you also may be wondering why I added an entire row that just simply says does nothing multiple times. Well, this is actually really important. Uh, the fact that time walk will do nothing um, when it can't understand a date expression is actually what we want to happen. Other tools might replace the date expression with the word null when they are unable to parse it, which means that the original data, even though it's bad, is now lost. So as much as we were excited by the time walk results being able to handle some of our more interesting date expressions, we wanted to stop and make sure that we were making the most of this tool. So by doing some quality control first, we could more competent, re, competently rely on time walk to parse the majority of our dates. I did have to do some manual editing of some dates that time walk could and, um, well, would and could not be expected to understand. So for example, I saw that there were some three digit dates where it looked like a number was missing. And I was able to use context from the collection and my basic understanding of dates to add the missing number. So in the example here, 160 could be either 1860 or 1960, but I was able to look at other files in the collection and determine that it should be in the 1900s and not the 1800s. 
So since we were planning to take an automatic an automated approach already, we also considered using a script to essentially find and replace those problem words that we that could be found in the date expression for dates that time walk would not be able to understand. So we could do this by basically incorporating a list of words to find and replace inside of a script. We could easily change things like J-A-N with a period to the full word January, along with other months where abbreviations were used. Additionally, we could change things like no date or ND to the word undated. We could also have time walk parse the date expressions that had unnecessary text in the expression field simply by moving, removing the problem text. So we could change D period 1910 to something time walk could parse by removing any string containing D and a following period, leaving the date as 1910. And in a similar way, remove the word exhibited from dates like exhibited colon 1960. Doing this work initially would allow time walk to do a lot more of the heavy lifting for us. So before actually writing the script, we needed to think about what exactly it needed to do and how it needed to do it. So by auditing our date data, I was able to compile a list of words that the date, in the date expression field that would hinder time walks performance. This list of words would then be used to create a find and replace function, the one that I mentioned earlier. Um, working with the head of processing, we were able to use this as an opportunity to standardize some of the language that we use in the date expression field. We decided that all unknown dates should be recorded as the word undated and months should be spelled out fully, abbreviations should not be used. In thinking about the script, we also had to decide how we wanted to run it. Did we want to run it once on our entire repository or run it on each individual finding aid? We decided that since we would be running the script on production, we would want to run it per finding aid to avoid running the script on a finding aid that was being actively edited by another member of our team. So working with the digital strategies team, we were able to create a script that would update problematic date expressions and then trigger time walk to parse the dates on each archival object within a given finding aid. The script is called replace date expressions.py and it can be found on our in our GitHub repository and it's also linked here. The script essentially walks a resource tree, meaning it goes through each archival object inside of a resource record. So in most cases, these would be series or files, and it looks at the date expression for each archival object and replaces it if it conforms to one of the patterns outlined in the find and replace function. The script then touches each record, which means it essentially opens and saves it, which triggers time walk. Time, by saving each record, regardless of if its date expression data was updated, it triggers the time walk plugin. So upon saving, time walk would parse the date expression and fill out the appropriate structured dates. So I began running the script across each one of our finding aids. Working alone and dedicating most of my time to running the script, I was able to get through about 200 finding aids a week. Knowing that we had another 1,500 finding aids to go, I recruited Katie and Darren to assist with running the script. We were able to divide our list of finding aids into three sections and assigned ourselves each a grouping to work on. With their help, we were able to complete the project in a little over a month. And thanks to automation, we updated hundreds of thousands of archival object records over 1,700 finding aids. So now that we've done all this work, we really just wanted to make sure that this wouldn't happen again. Um, of course, a lot of this missing data came from system migrations and legacy data, but we still just wanted to make sure that we're doing everything we can to adhere to best practices. So we have kept TimeWalk installed on our production server of ArchivesSpace, where it continues to be used without running a script. Because TimeWalk is a plugin that operates pretty much invisibly on the back end of ArchivesSpace, we can utilize it without doing anything differently. As long as a date expression is entered, TimeWalk will automatically parse it upon saving the record. This not only ensures data quality going forward, but in our case, it also saves processing archivists from entering dates twice, 
since we use both the date expression and structure date fields in each record. On a more reflective note, it's obvious that automation allows us to delegate more and more tasks to machines, especially with the help of scripts and open source code. But there are times where human intervention is needed. Throughout this project, I constantly encountered the question of what is the job that's best suited for a machine and what is a job that's best suited for a human. I think this project and all of the other data cleanup projects mentioned earlier by my colleagues are examples of combining both manual and automated approaches to fulfill a common goal. So thank you for joining us for um, our presentation. And um, as I mentioned earlier, this presentation is a rendering of a blog series that Katie, Darren, and myself have authored. And these blog posts can be found on the Rockefeller Archive Center blog and the individual posts are linked here. We do understand that these projects and all of their nuances may be a lot to take in. So feel free to read more about them in the blog posts. And additionally, for anyone interested in the scripts mentioned throughout the presentation, they are available on our GitHub page, which is also linked here. So thank you again. And um, I believe we have a few minutes to answer some questions that have come up. All right, yes. Thank you all so much. That was, that was really great. Um, and we are now gonna go ahead and open the floor to questions and comments. Uh, again, we do ask that you type your question into the Q&A panel instead of the chat box. Um, users are welcome to comment on the questions that are popping up in the Q&A. If, if a question arises that you can give some insight into, please feel free to comment. And a copy of that Q&A is what will be included with the recording of this webinar. Uh, in addition, of course, to the webinar slides and links to the blog and uh, to the GitHub. So all of these resources will be included with the recording. So I'm going to go ahead and dive into the questions. Um, Nancy asks, re-merging performance. Can you provide more details about the kinds of invalid date in the agents that cause performance problems? Yeah, I can answer that question. Um, so I believe it was an indexing problem in ArchivesSpace. And um, Patrick, who's our uh, system administrator for ArchivesSpace and our IT department look and our IT department looked into it. Um, I believe the issues it was either involving the rules field on some of the agents or the name fields. Um, but I can't remember specifically. And I think the thing with with it what was strange was it didn't really the issue didn't really stand out. It's like we couldn't because of we kind of saw those issues in other records. We weren't really sure why those agents it caused the indexing problem. Thanks, Darren. And yeah, I think I think Patrick's an attendee here. So if he has, if you'd like to add anything, please feel free to to chat. Um. Next. Question. Great webinar. Thank you. Uh, thank you for attending. I'm super impressed as always at everything that the Rockefeller Archive Center manages to accomplish. I think we can all agree on that. Can you please comment on the amount and level of support you receive from the digital strategies team? I'm interested in how much support you received on each project and what that looked like, as well as what the working relationship is between the archives team and the digital strategies team in general. I can jump in and, and talk a little bit about that. So I think for all three of these projects, um, they, the, the projects were primarily um, completed by the processing team. So myself, Katie and Darren, but um, with the support of digital strategies and that support was just um, basically kind of looking at it from their perspective of um, looking at our code and making sure that you know the code was working as intended and if we had any issues with the code and thinking it thinking about it more kind of in lines with what our new discovery system is going to be since they are the ones creating that um i think a lot of the coding and um kind of more technical work actually in this case was done by the three processing archivists and i think that's something that's relatively new that's happening in our institution um, where people who are not in the digital strategies team are working with code um, and because we're working with code we are able to look at it from our individual departments um, and create code that does what we want from um, you know a processing point of view um, so they kind of were like 
they were they were supportive um, of what we were doing, giving us new ideas about how to kind of make scripts maybe run more more efficiently. Because again, we're talking about dealing with so much data that at this point, um, efficiency did matter. Um, so kind of using their experience with code to um, review our work and they were always somebody that we can go with questions if we had any issues with, um, you know, why is something not working? Why am I not getting the value that I expected to get from the archive space API? Um, why is archive snake not working? Those were questions that we could go to them for assistance with and um, the digital strategy team is is not IT. So um, those are two distinct departments also in our um, at the RIC. So um, the digital strategies team more or less supports um, kind of digital initiatives, I guess, across the entire archive center. So in this case, those initiatives being data cleanup initiatives that were taken on by processing um, to work with some of the data in archive space. Thanks. Um, Vivian Lee has a question uh, about, this is about time walk. When you say months are spelled out, are you using the full month, i.e. January instead of Jan? Are you doing this on file labels as well? Yes, so with, okay, so what with time walk is able to parse abbreviated date expressions as long as they don't have a period at the end. At least this is what I found through my research um, and kind of playing around with time walk. So if you have something like J-A-N, time walk will be able to parse that. But if you have J-A-N period, time walk was not able to parse those dates in my experience. Um, either way, um, we had discussed with head of processing that we probably shouldn't be using abbreviations anyways. So that's where that find and replace function came in where we said, hey, look in the date expression field, and if there's abbreviations of months like J-A-N or F-E-B, both versions with those with and without periods, just please change them to the full month of January or February and then save the record. I hope that helps. Thanks. Another time walk question from Noah. I'm curious if there was a reason you decided to run the cleanup script on each resource record individually versus running across all resources and archival objects at once. Yes, um, so that was a decision that we made because we were running the script on the production server of archive space, which basically is the workspace for a lot of other staff members and um, because we were running the script throughout the day. We just didn't want to interfere with a finding aid that someone was working on. And you would get kind of this, you know, pop up on your screen saying someone else is working in this finding aid. And we, we just didn't want to freak other people out, especially, um, you know, that we have a staff that is larger and, and a lot of people are doing a lot of different things um, in archive space. So that was just a decision based on like our institution and, and how things end up working with us. but. I'm sure that you could run it across an entire repository just for us that would have taken so long that I'm not, I am not 100% sure that even if we started it over a three day weekend, um, if it would be finished by the time we came in Monday morning. Thanks Amy. Um, another question about time walk um, and can the time walk plugin read other languages besides English? I have to admit that I don't know the answer to that question. Um, there is the links um, within this uh, PowerPoint that point to the GitHub page for time walk. Um, and I think there's also other folks at other institutions who have used time walk for, for things like this. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but it might be in the documentation. So that, that would be where I would suggest to look. But I'm sorry, I don't, I didn't actually look into um, dealing with other languages. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure either, but um, to piggyback on what Amy said, um, viewing that GitHub page and maybe contacting uh, the author directly, you'll be able to get that, get that answer. Um, and that would be Alex Jury who would, who would know the answer to that, who wrote that. 
Um, I'll also put in a shameless plug. If you are, if anyone here is an Archive Space member and they are interested in attending or plan to attend the Archive Space member forum, uh, we are going to be doing a 15 minute session on Time Walk, sort of a show and tell. So if you are interested in this, please uh, feel free to register for the, for the member forum so that um, you can see Alex demo that in real time. Or I shouldn't say demo, I don't know if he's gonna demo, but he's gonna talk about it. <laughs> Um, next question. I am wondering why you chose to remove D1910 or D period 1910 and exhibited 1960. I know Time Walk couldn't understand these, but don't you lose the speci specificity of these dates if it's just removed? Were these entered as created dates or were you able to specify the details of these dates in other fields? So I think in, in both of the examples given there, um, this was not something that was used quite often in our date expressions. They were, so for the D period, that was just kind of like one-off things that I'd seen a couple of those. And um, we had made the decision with head of processing that this, that we would just remove the D period for that, for the sake of being able to have time walk parse it. So we did kind of consciously make that decision. Um, as for the exhibited, um, colon um, date expressions, those were present, I believe, if my memory serves me correct, and um, I think it was primarily a collection about art exhibits where it was obvious that the dates were, and by obvious I mean it was obvious by the context of the collection and also by what things were in the collection and the file names that these were exhibited dates um, and not necessarily like other dates. I don't know if I'm explaining that correctly. Um, but both of those were just decisions that we made because um, part of it is, is that we, we had so much data to get through that um, we did have to make, not, I'm not going to say like sacrifices, but we did have to make certain decisions. And that was just a decision that, that we, we decided to make um, just to have Time Walk um, perform better. Thanks, Amy. Um, Anna asks a question that if there had been time, I was going to ask, what other data cleanup projects are on the horizon? And if so, how do you determine which projects to take on? Katie or Darren, do you want to take this? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I can answer this. So we recently removed a lot of library data from archive space. So I think going forward, we're just going to keep working um, to kind of clean up from what was left over on that project. So that entails removing a lot of orphan agents and orphan top containers that are still currently, or they, I think so we've removed the resources, but we're still working on the orphan agents. And then going forward, we wanna tackle subjects. Yeah, so we're in the process, the three of us, um, and you know, in collaboration with Digital Strategies um, of writing scripts to find orphan um, objects in archive space and, basically get a list of in a CSV of, of orphan subjects, orphan agents, and then use an additional script that Katie has, had worked on writing um, to take that CSV and delete those from archive space. So we're really just trying to trim down the amount of data that we have in archive space. Um, and a lot of this came from the fact that we did put library records in archive space, which, um, you know, allotted for a lot of our more interesting agents, which end up being kind of publishing companies and, and stuff that really wasn't collect, um, connected to like our archival data. So in being able to remove those library records uh, via a script that um, the three of us worked on, um, that kind of left a lot of these orphaned things in archive space. So we're just doing um, some tidying up. So that's kind of phase two of this, which is what we're currently working on. Okay, thanks. All right, we have about three more minutes, um, and I think we can get to both of these questions. Um, Melanie asks, regarding labor, you mentioned processing archivists are doing more coding. How do you decide who will work on these projects, and is there competition? Um, I can answer this. Uh, so, yeah, I think, I think the people who are working on coding inside the processing team right now um, as far as I know 
strictly for the processing team. It just might be me, Katie, and Darren. Um, and that's just because of some of the nature of projects that we were assigned. And, and I also probably have to mention that a lot of us are newer, newer hires to the RAC. Um, and we were kind of like approached some of our first projects to start thinking about learning code. And, and all of us, I think, took a leap at that because it was just something so great that we're like, wow, our institution is, you know, offering for us to take time and, and learn how to code. And this is something that can help us, you know, at the RAC and beyond. And I think we just took advantage that of that with like one or two projects in the beginning. And it's now kind of been really ingrained in a lot of the work that we do. Um, and, you know, we're able to, you know, we're able to, to help out digital strategies teams with some of their initiative and they're able to assist us. So it's just become a lot more collaborative um, uh, relationships between teams because of that. And, and there's also people on collections management that have dipped their toe in the waters of coding too. So I think it just speaks that to that, um, the fact that like our institution had um, allowed us the time um, and you know, work time to, to put towards learning to code, which um, I think is, is really great. And of course, we just took advantage of that because it's something that we can use, you know, beyond the work that we're doing now. So um, I don't think that there is necessarily like um, competition for these projects because um, Katie, Darren, and I work together really well when writing code. So we'll take a more collaborative approach. And because we're relatively new, like I'm not gonna say new, but we we are still like new at coding. Um, having more than one mind in the room is really helpful. And especially when we hit those frustrating snags where we're not really sure what's going on, just being able to kind of talk to each other, um, knowing that you're talking to another person who kind of has the same um, experience that you do, which is a processing archivist who has never coded before learning how to code, um, you know, kind of makes it easier to, um, I guess, be more blunt about things that you're trying to do. Um, so we work really well collaborat collaboratively together. So I think we're, the three of us are really comfortable dividing and conquering things like with our next phase of cleanup projects, you know, we divided and conquered. I think we wrote maybe about five or six scripts to accomplish those things that we were talking about. And we just divided and conquered those. So um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a good relationship, and um, yeah, we're all like kind of pushing each other um, to to learn more, and we're also learning more from each other. Thanks, Amy. All right, we have one more question. Um, Nancy asked, would archive space consider including time walk or something similar in core code? So I'm going to go ahead and answer that one. Um, yeah, that's definitely not outside the realm of possibility. Um, as you guys know, uh, version 2.8 is going to include um, what was originally the Harvard import tool plugin as part of core code. And um, if you view on our wiki under the contributing section, there's actually a, some documentation about how uh, basically how to make a plugin into core code, the basics of that. And really the start is a conversation, a conversation like this where people are expressing a massive amount of interest. So um, I, I'm not sure if there is currently a ticket about this in existence, um, but that, that would be a great place to start the conversation, uh, maybe on the listserv to get some traction. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's definitely a possibility and we do have the infrastructure in place to take a plugin into core code if it's decided that it, it it does serve the community to incorporate it uh, instead of leaving it separate. So yeah, Nancy, that's that's definitely something that could happen. Vivian says, I think it would be great to be part of the core code. Uh, all right. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, we are past the hour, so we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, and we don't have any other questions in the chat. So with that, I will thank all of you for attending and I will thank Amy, uh, Katie and Darren for presenting. This was really great and very in informative. Um, I look forward to seeing you all at the next webinar. Thank you.